Good morning, everybody. Welcome to SMCC. We are so happy to have you here with us. Would you please stand? Let's worship together. We're going to sing. We're going to get loud. Let's go. We sing, this is the day. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. For all my hope is in your name And now your joy awaits my praise I give thanks I give thanks for all you have done And I will sing of your mercy and your love Your love is unfailing Lord, I am
magnify Christ with our lives. But that means we need to decrease and he needs to increase. We need to put aside our selfish ambitions and focus on our center being him and him alone. Let's sing about that. We're going to not bow to idols. We're going to put him center. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being with us. If we haven't met before, my name is Mike. I'm the campus pastor here at Draper, and this is Heather, obviously one of the worship team singers and also an SMCCU teacher. So glad to have you with us. And if you've never filled out a connection card before, I know if you're brand new, you're like, why would I want to give you my information? But we really want your information so we can help you. Uh, there's a bunch of circles on there that you can check for different reasons, and uh, you can turn those cards in at the Next Steps counter out there. And one of the things that you could indicate on there is if you're interested in joining a community group. These are groups that meet in people's homes, and they're doing life together. They're on their spiritual journey together. And we would love to get as many of you into community groups as possible. So you can check that box and talk to Leslie out there at the counter about a group that would work for you. There's a new group that we just formed that is gonna be meeting down here on Thursdays. I just wanna put a bug in your ear. If, you're, if you fall into this category, we're calling it kind of the solos group. So these are people not necessarily single, but they're on their spiritual journey alone for whatever reason. They might be single, they might not be. And so anyway, there's gonna be a Bible study meeting down here on Thursday nights for people like that. And if you're interested, let them know about that at the counter as well. Now, Heather, you've been running you know, community groups for a long time. So what has been the most impactful thing that you've observed in people's lives as you've done that? You know, I mean, when we first moved to Utah, one of the things we loved about joining the community group was the authentic, real relationships we were able to build with people within our community. Some of my best friends have come from community groups, and it's because we've been able to challenge each other, we've been able to sit alongside each other during life's hard moments, and as well as the good moments, keep each other accountable. That happens when you're actually meeting with each other on a regular build right. building, uh, building community around it. We have a lot of different ways that you can actually build community here. Uh, a couple of ones I wanna call out that are coming up. Number one is SMYA, where's my young adults? This is a South Mountain young adults. They're 18 to 25, they're not even willing to say hi guys, but they're down there. Okay, I know they're sitting you. right over here. I know, I know they're over there. Uh, this is 18 to 25, we have a kickoff tomorrow night pool party, there's tacos involved. You do need to register if you actually want tacos. So if you are in that 18 to 25 spot, make sure you register. It's gonna be a great time. 
The second thing I want to talk about is the divorce care. If you are going through uh, the unfortunate situation of, of divorce and you want to find community around that, every Tuesday night, starting this Tuesday night, we meet, they, they meet in the Draper campus here. And it's a great chance for you to be able to be with people living life through that situation. Uh, the, the last two are around our women's ministry. If you are a woman and you are looking for ways to plug in, we have a Moms Connect group, which is for moms that are, have young kids. That's going to start meeting on September 11th. We also have a women's Bible studies, and they're all across campuses. There's a lot of different times. There's a lot of different ways you can get plugged in. That starts mid-September. So if you are a woman who wants to do Bible study, that's the place for you to go. And if you want more information, fill out your Connect card, drop it off at the Next Steps booth at the lobby. Absolutely. Absolutely. Finally, uh, we had a Connect Now lunch back on August 4th, and a lot of people couldn't make that one. We're having another one today. So if you would like to come and learn more about the mission, vision, and values of South Mountain, uh, get a chance to meet some of the staff, ask questions, and uh, let us get to know you a little bit more, we've got a free lunch. Who said there's no free lunches? And we also have childcare. So if you, if you want to come to this event, just come to the youth room over here at 1230. We'd love to have you. And that's today. Right that's after today, this right after this service. Fantastic. Well, one thing that we also are entering into is a time of uh, back to school. I don't know if any other family is feeling the um, stress and the anxiety that comes with going back to school, at least our family is. And so I wanted to take some time for us to pray for our educators and our students as we enter into this time and season. Will you join me in praying for them? Lord God, we are so thankful for the opportunity that we have structure that we can bring back into our lives this fall, but we also are thankful that you have a chance for our kids and our teachers to be able to meet together to learn more. And yet at the same time, Lord, we know that our students are walking down the halls and entering into classrooms where they are gonna need to have wisdom and have you alongside of them. And so we pray for the kids that are calling SNCC home and others that are navigating this world in the classroom. Lord, may you be with them. May you give them guidance and may they be able to glorify you in the actions that they have within the school building. Additionally, Lord, we also just want to lift up all the educators and teachers, Lord. They have a hard job, but we are so thankful that you have provided their skills to be able to help our students. And so we ask that they, in their jobs, have the wisdom to know how to handle the classroom, know how to be able to, to live a life that is pleasing to you so that it's reflected on the kids in their classroom, Lord. May you be given glory and be magnified in our students and teachers here. We praise you today because you are worthy of praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, for those of you I haven't met, my name's Trevor. I serve as one of the pastors here at SMCC. Just wanna say thank you so much for joining us, whether it's your first Sunday here, whether you've been coming here for years, we're just glad that you trusted us with a chunk of your Sunday morning. Now, I wanna open up with a bit of just an observation, something that I discovered that uh, is one indication of one of the ways in which Utah is better than every other state. So I thought I'd share that with you uh, this morning. And uh, basically, one study found that Utah, a study in work-life balance found that Utah is better, is the best, is the number one state in the country when it comes to work-life balance, that we work an average of 37.1 hours per week. And uh, according to whatever it means to win, that means we're winning. So, uh, so yay us. <laughs> and and uh, I gotta be honest, when I first heard that, I was like, either this means we really do have the healthiest approach to work and we've got a good relationship with it and that's a really wonderful thing, or we just don't like to work a whole lot and it's one or the other, but either way we're winning and so I'll take, I'll take the W. <laughs> but, but let me say this, I did a little bit of math and uh, 37.1, if you take that and multiply it by 52 for weeks of the year, what that comes out to exactly, I have no idea, but round about 2,000, 2,000 hours uh, that we spend at work every single year. Uh, 2,000 hours, you know, plugging away at code or um, educating kids within a classroom or, uh, you know, working in the restaurant industry or whatever it might be, taking meetings remotely over Zoom or taking care of kids in a home, whatever it looks like, 2,000 hours 
a year. Now, when you take that across sort of uh, an adult working lifespan across 40 years, what you find is that 2,000 hours, multiply it by 40, that's 80,000 hours. 80,000 hours of our lives that we give to this thing called work, uh, which is a pretty significant number. But to press into it a little bit more, I want to share a quote with you from the phys uh, physicist and uh, mathematician. He was a smart guy, Albert Einstein. He said this, put your hand on a hot stove for a minute and it seems like an hour. Sit with a pretty girl for an hour and it seems like a minute. That's relativity. Now, beyond watching Oppenheimer, I can't tell you what relativity means, but what I can share with you is what he's leaning into there is just the idea that uh, what you're doing within time, the degree to which you enjoy it, that has a significant impact on your experience of it. And so if you enjoy your work, if you like what you do, if it's something that you look forward to and you kind of thrive when you're in the midst of it, then those 80,000 hours, you're kind of like, okay, that's, that's all right, I can deal with that because I enjoy what I do. But if you find your work frustrating, if you find it difficult, if you find it demanding, if you find it irritating, if you find it to be tedious or dull or boring, then those 80,000 hours are gonna feel like a whole lot more than 80,000 hours and they will be anything but pleasant even though they make up a significant amount of the waking hours that your life will consist of. So just thought I'd share that good news with you this morning and cheer you up, wish you a happy Sunday. But, um, but I'll say this, honestly, I think our experience of work, whether it's positive or negative, pleasant or not pleasant, I think it, uh, so much of it comes down to our ability to answer one significant question, which is just this, why does my work matter? Why does your work matter? Why does what we do for work matter? Why is it significant? Our ability to answer that question, I would argue, is one of the most significant factors in shaping what those 80,000 hours feel like. And that's why what I'd like to explore together this morning is just the answer to that question. As today, we're continuing and actually bringing to a close our series called Breaking the Silence, where uh, we've been exploring the concept of worship. And biblically speaking, one of the main ideas that we've lifted uh, from the biblical writings for this series is that all of life is worship because fundamentally we're created for worship. And so we've looked at what that looks like in different aspects of life from kind of private spiritual practices and disciplines. Uh, we've looked at kind of public gatherings of worship like this. And if I could drop a quick commercial in, one of the things you might've noticed on your chair when you came in was a, a card for the worship night. Uh, really the main next step that we're encouraging and inviting people to take um, as, as a result of this series, coming out of this series, is a worship night that we're hosting at the South Jordan campus this Thursday night, seven o'clock. And so chance for us to come together much like we do on Sunday morning, but to do things a little bit differently, just some freedom that we have meeting on Thursday night instead of Sunday morning. So would love to see you there. And that is your invitation. Um, but now today, as we bring the series to a close, we're looking at worship in the context of community. And I would argue that the most significant contribution we make to our communities is within and through our work. And so our work is part of our lives, our lives, our worship. What does it look like for her work to matter as an aspect of worship? That's where I wanna go. And so to frame this up, uh, I wanna open up really to the very beginning of the Bible, look at a couple of passages um, that frame this conversation particularly well. The first one coming in the first book of the Bible and the first chapter of that book, Genesis chapter one, verse 26, going all the way to 28. This is what it says. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Okay, so there's something interesting here. God says that he's gonna make humanity within his image. And then flowing out from this is an assignment given to humanity to basically exercise dominion over the earth, to have a responsibility of caring for the earth in such a way that brings about its flourishing in our own. That's what we see in verse 26. Then the passage continues, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground, right? Again, we see the continuation of that assignment that basically humanity is created in God's image and what flows out of that idea is this assignment we're given to join God in the work of completing 
the work of creation. Now, I think what's also fascinating, what adds to this is the idea that this passage arises within the first chapter of the Bible where we see God doing particular things. Right, that, that in verse one of chapter one, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God brings all things into being, all things into existence, creates everything out of nothing. And then following from that, verses two on, you see God taking the material of creation and forming it and structuring it and bringing order to it in such a way that brings about the possibility of our lives. And at the very end of that process, you see God creating actually humanity and doing so in a way where we're created in his image, where we bear, every single one of us bears the image of God. And you see an assignment attached to this that in some ways mirrors exactly what God has done in this chapter. And what this is unpacking, what this is unfolding for us is the meaning of what it means to be created in the image of God, right? It's not getting at some kind of physical resemblance. It's not saying that we look like God in the same way you look like your mom or your dad, because one of the things the biblical writings are extraordinarily clear about is that God is not physical. God doesn't have a body like you and I do. And so to be created in the image of God is to function in a similar way, which is exactly what we see from the context of this passage. And so what this is telling us is that one aspect of what it means to be created in the image of God is that you were created to create and to provide order for the sake of flourishing. That you and I were created to bring about these things in a small way that mirrors what God has done in creation. We take what God has already created and shape it and form it and create other things out of it that contribute to the flourishing of other people. In other words, you and I were created for work. Not entirely, but significantly. Work is a significant aspect of what you and I were made for. Now, uh, I'm guessing that there's probably a couple of us, at least, who are sitting with in this room and thinking, okay, so if I was created for work, then why do I feel the way that I do about my work? Why don't I enjoy it more? If this is in alignment with what I'm made for, then why do I hate it? Why do you think I'm not there so much, right? I really don't like it. So how can this be the case? And I think the answer to that question comes as we continue the flow of the narrative over the next couple of chapters. So this is what we see. Moving ahead one chapter, Genesis 2.15. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. So what we see here is God giving a responsibility, giving a task, giving a position, giving a job really to Adam here. And then Eve is created after this. They share the responsibility together. We see work actually being given to humanity uh, because it's in alignment with what they are made for. And notice this happens before chapter three, before the fall, before the entrance of sin into humanity, before brokenness begins to play a role within our relationship with God and our relationships with each other. And I get that some of that language may not make 100% sense, but let me just uh, kind of walk into Genesis 3 and unpack what happens there, right? So what we see, Genesis 2, they're given this responsibility, this job, because it's in alignment with what they're created for. They're made for work, and work is what they're given. But then in Genesis 3, what we see is that God uh, has given them this restriction, this one boundary, that of all of the trees within the garden that produce fruit, they can eat from and enjoy and delight in every single one of them except for one, one restriction is given. Don't eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the one rule that is given. You might ask, well, why on earth was that even there? And it's because it presented the opportunity for them to either trust God as the ultimate authority within their lives, to trust him or to reject God's authority and trust themselves. And unfortunately, the latter is what they opted for. And so they eat the fruit of the tree, they reject God's authority, they choose not to trust him, and the immediate consequence of that is brokenness. Uh, What we would call sin enters the human condition. Our relationship with God is broken, our relationship with each other is broken, and the consequences of this event are so far reaching, it's difficult to even imagine. But one of the consequences that is spelled out even within the chapter is the impact that this has upon our work. Genesis 3, 17 to 19, this is what we see. This is God speaking to Adam. He says, um, he says this to Adam. He said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. 
It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken. For dust you are and to dust you will return. One of the things we see at the end there is that the result of this event is that humanity is now subject to death, something that has impacted and will impact every single person. But even prior to that, what we find is that uh, as a result of this, the ground is cursed, which is bringing about an ecological reality, right? That uh, it will now produce thorns and thistles. Adam's work of farming and cultivating and caring for the garden will become more difficult, but it extends beyond just ecological realities as well. That in a sense, this is a metaphor that applies to all of our work that whether you work on a farm or whether you work uh, digitally or whether you work in a classroom or whether you work in a coffee shop, whatever it might be, the thorns and thistles are there and they are a reality. Um, on the other side of the fall, what this tells us is that our experience of work is irritated by thorns and thistles. And so that doesn't change the fact that we were created for work, but it does mean that work is no longer as enjoyable, no longer as easy, no longer as peaceful as it once was. It is irritated by the reality of thorns and thistles. And chances are you don't have to think too hard to locate a thorn or a thistle within your work. But I would just caution you to remember that you may be the thorn or the thistle for somebody else. <laughs> so. If we take a couple of leaps forward in the biblical narrative, what we see here um, is, you know, you kind of jump to the New Testament. What we see is that um, in the person of Jesus, God takes on our humanity, steps into our human experience, lives the perfect life you and I never could, then offers himself on the cross sacrificially for us, entering into death in order to bring about our redemption. Then he rises from the grave and invites us into the way of life that we were meant for, a life built on a trusting relationship in him, the life that Adam and Eve rejected when they ate from the fruit from the tree. Jesus uh, brings about the opportunity for us to be restored to that through his death and resurrection. Now on the other side of this, the church is born, the entity or the organization that really uh, has, carries the responsibility of carrying the message of Jesus, what is known as the gospel or the good news of Jesus, the message of his life, death, and resurrection. And the New Testament from that point forward uh, is basically these letters that were written in the first century by leaders in the church to different communi communities, churches, who were located in different cities throughout the Roman Empire. And one example is the book of Colossians, or the letter, a right? letter written by a man named Paul, one of these leaders, to a church located in the ancient city of Colossae. And what he says to them in chapter three uh, ties into our conversation today. Chapter three, verse 17, he says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In other words, all of life is worship. And on the other side of this, he even gets into practicals and particulars about what it looks like to do this in the context of our relationships, our households, and even within our work as well. And what we see you know, even going back to just the practical fact, 80,000 hours is a pretty significant chunk of what your waking adult life will be. And if all of life is worship, what that tells us is that work is one of your most significant opportunities for worship because it is one of the most significant aspects of your life, just looking through the lens of the time alone that it will take up. And yet we were made for it in the same way that we were made for worship. And so work is one of the most significant opportunities for worship that you and I will have. And when we can approach it in that way, I think it gives us the ability to, to find a productivity within our work that doesn't lead to burnout, uh, to find a sense of peace within our work instead of anxiety, to find a sense of joy within our work instead of frustration and irritation. Not that those other things don't exist, but they don't become the primary markers of our experience in work because we're properly oriented to it. Now, I do think one of the interesting things just about the human condition in general is that we can't escape what we are, that, that we can't escape even the ways that we've been designed, what we've been created for. And one of the reasons that all of life is worship is because we were created for all of life to be worship. And we, one of the series, if you were here, you, you probably remember us talking about how uh, worship is something that we can't help but do. We're designed to worship. 
And so whether our life is oriented around the worship of Jesus or not, we will worship something. And because we're also created for work, what that tells us is whether we're oriented around Jesus within our work or not, worship will play a significant role in what our working life looks like. And what I'd like to do is spend a little time unpacking that together. And I wanna get there with this question. What does winning at work look like? Because again, right, If you watch the Olympics, you know, as Americans, we love to win. We've got the cowbell and everything. We love it. Um, And Utah in particular, Utahns love to win, maybe even more than the typical American. And so the question is, when it comes to work, what does winning look like? I think there are mainly three options. The first one is this. Winning at work means making the most while giving the least. Making the most money, getting the most PTO, the most um, uh, kind of experience or whatever it is that you're looking to get, the kind of great things to come out of a particular role. How can you get the absolute most out of a thing? How can you uh, squeeze it dry like a sponge and get every last drop out of it while giving the absolute least, the bare minimum that you have to, to get the benefits that you want? Giving the most or giving, getting the most while giving the least. Now, I know I've probably riled up at least a couple of boomers already with this who are ready to just see this blown to bits. Let me just, let me just pause you right there and say that we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to a couple of angles on this. But um, I'll say this. I want to lean into where this approach comes from, I think. I think one of the most significant shifts that produced this within our country is on the other side of World War II, with the rise of modern advertising in the 50s, there was a specific goal that was formed to change the culture of our country away from a needs-based culture and into a desire and a wants-based culture. And so that means what was marketed to us in terms of products and experiences uh, shifted away from things that met our needs and towards things that actually cultivated our desires and then promised to meet them. And so what shifted with that was fundamentally on a heart level, instead of uh, understanding the good life as being sort of contribution-based, the good life became consumption-based, that to have the good life, sort of the vision that our hearts became captivated by, uh, meant being able to experience and enjoy and do all of these different things that are marketed to us, that this became the experience. And so this has a significant role in shaping what it looks like to approach Works. I think one of the most concrete embodiments of this particular vision is the FIRE movement. Financially independent, retire early. And hear me, I am not saying that everything about that is wrong or bad, but I do think that one of the most significant motivators for buying into this is when our hearts have been captivated by this particular understanding of what the good life looks like. That basically, it's making as much money as you possibly can, as quickly as you possibly can, so that you can retire and be financially independent as early as you can, to be freed up from work, to just enjoy your life. And so if you can basically retire at, um, I have no idea how that's coming out of my sleeve. I don't know what that, <laughs> but my, if you can be freed up, if you can be freed up to, uh, I'm glad a couple of you think that's funny. <laughs> My cord's tangled, I don't know what's happening, but it's a thorn and a thistle, right? Um, (laughs) Yeah, so basically, if I can make enough money to develop my assets, you know, whether it's dividend paying stocks or whether it's real estate assets that I don't have to tend to a whole lot, uh, and so I can retire at 40 and just enjoy a steady stream of income from those, and so I can backpack through Europe, I can surf an endless summer, I can enjoy exotic cuisine, I can be freed up to do whatever I would like to do and just enjoy my life without having to work because I've got this steady stream from the assets that I have developed. If that's what it looks like to win, then this flows into a pretty particular understanding of the role that work plays within our lives, and it is not positive, because work becomes not something that we are made for, but just a means to an end, something that we give ourselves to begrudgingly to make as much as we can to get to this place where we no longer have to work anymore. And hear me, I'm not saying that everything about that is wrong, but if our hearts have been captivated by that particular understanding, what that means is that if winning at work means not needing to work, then we will always feel like losers at work. 
Because if winning means not needing to, then every day that we have to go into the office, every day we have to log into a Zoom meeting, every day you've got to correct another paper or quiz or exam, every day you've got to make another pour over, you're losing, you're failing. And so it's no wonder that that one Gallup survey actually found that only 13.3% of people enjoy their work because the very fact of having to work means that you are failing and you're losing if this is the vision that's captivated your heart. And so for that reason, I don't recommend it as an option for understanding what it looks like to win. Second one is this, winning at work means working more than all the rest. Winning at work means working more than all the rest. This one's a little bit older in its sensibilities. And basically, it understands work as a proving ground for your worth, that this is the place where you demonstrate why you matter and why you have value. And so if this is how we approach our work, it opens us up to basically want to take on whatever we can, whatever responsibilities. I'll take on this over here. I'll step into that leadership project. I'll step into these responsibilities. I can take that on, add that to my plate. I'll develop these skills over here so I can contribute that as well. I'll do whatever I can to make the biggest contribution that I can because that is where my worth is proven and found. The poet Robert Frost has kind of a funny quote about this. He says, by faithfully working eight hours a day, you may one day get to be a boss and work 12 hours a day. (laughs) And I'm sure that probably resonates with some of you more than you wish it did. (laughs) But, But I think the problem with this approach is that if work becomes the way I prove my worth, then my relationship with work will always be unstable. And I think it's sort of a pendulum approach, right? That on the one hand, it becomes unstable because when it's working, when I'm doing great, when I'm stepping into responsibilities and I'm crushing it and everyone's happy with me and they're pleased and things are going well, that feels good, right? That that feeds the ego in a very pleasant way. And so I'm gonna continue to pour more in and pour more into that and give more of myself to it only to find that at the end of the day, at a certain point, the thorns and the thistles inevitably begin arising. And I'm giving more of myself to this, which means I have less time for myself, less time for my relationships, less time for my health, but I'm giving more and more to this because I think this is gonna be worth it and I like the attention I'm getting. And then all of a sudden, the thorns and the thistles begin to arise. And what was once going so well is no longer going well anymore. Right, that projects are stopping and stalling and getting dropped altogether, that I'm having conflict within my work relationships. People aren't so pleased with me anymore. People aren't happy with me anymore. Things aren't going the way that I want them to go. And it can become so all-consuming because not only have we gotten ourselves to a place where we're giving almost all of ourselves to our work, but even when we're not there, we get so caught up with the drama of it that it's the only thing that we talk about that our mind and our emotions and our attention, it just naturally drifts always back to our work, to the things we're frustrated, to the thorns and the thistles, so that it becomes all-consuming, so that there is no room for anything else within our lives, because work, rather than being an instrument of our worship of God, has become our God itself. It's the real problem with this view is that it views work not as an instrument to worship God, it views work as the God that we worship. And so we give more of ourself and more of ourself and more of ourself to it in the hopes that it will be worth it. And that in the end, it will tell us that we are worth it and that we are valuable and that we are worthy. But the problem is, the more we give ourselves to it, the less it gives back. Because while work is an excellent instrument for worship, it is an awful object to worship itself. And so the question is, if that's not an option, right? If neither of those work out particularly well, what is the right way to do this? And I would say that I think there is a third way, and it's one that we find when we look to the life of Jesus. So for example, when we look at the life of Jesus, what we see is that he experienced the thorns and the thistles. People were upset with him. They weren't happy with him. They didn't always understand what he was saying or teaching, right? There were plenty of thorns and thistles, and yet he didn't see those as something that was uh, leading him to want to get away from work altogether, right? But he leaned into his work with faithfulness, understanding it as a way that he could worship God worship his father, the first person of the Trinity. But even beyond that, what we also see is that he didn't approach his ministry as sort of a way that he could uh, show or prove his value. 
that he wasn't trying to build a flat platform so people would be happy with him and that as a result of that, he would feel fulfilled and full and uh, satisfied, right? But instead, he approached all of his ministry, all of his work from the standpoint of knowing that his value was grounded in his relationship with his father. Right? The first person of the Trinity, his relationship is worth being grounded in the love that marked that relationship. And so he could move through his life and his work and his ministry with faithfulness, but also knowing that it wasn't the place where his value was found or proven. And he was able to lean into his faithfulness, even recognizing that his job description included death on a cross. But he was willing to enter into it in order to bring about our redemption, right? He wasn't working from a string of Israel Airbnbs that provided a stream of steady income, specializing in salmon and sourdough. He he leaned into the faithfulness, even with the thorns and the thistles. And so I think at the end of the day, what we find is that um, the third option is really just winning at work means seeing your work as an opportunity to worship Jesus. Winning at work means allowing our work to become our worship of Jesus. Now you might be asking, what does it look like practically speaking? Just wanna kinda share a couple of thoughts here at the end, Um, just three thoughts. So this is what we see. Uh, Faithfulness through the thorns and thistles. Faithfulness through the thorns and thistles. Oftentimes it's the thorns and thistles, the irritations, the frustrations, the difficulties at work that lead us to wanna get away from it. Um, And I think one of the most helpful things is to recognize that we are made for work. And so we can be faithful even through that. But if anything, let the thorns and thistles be a reminder that work is something that is still good for us, that God is shaping us through it, and yet it is not all of life. And so we can be faithful as we lean into it, recognizing that our work is an opportunity to worship Jesus. That's the first one. Second one is this. um, Remember where your value is found. That our value is not found in our work. It's not found in you stepping into this project. It's not found in you uh, doing a fantastic job with this leadership opportunity. That all of these are good things and they're opportunities to worship God. But when we approach our work, when we can approach it from the place of knowing that our value is found and grounded in the love of Christ is poured out for us on the cross, when we can move into our work, then we can approach it with faithfulness without overextending ourselves and letting it become all-consuming. Because when we approach it from that way, we don't need it to give us our value because our value is already set. So that's the second one. Remember where your value is found. And then the third one is just this, to allowing your work to contribute to every sphere of your life. Um, And this is just sort of a practical thing that I think in some ways is evident, yet it's worth mentioning. um, That Jesus, you know, his ministry wasn't self-funded, but other people who had skills were compensated for those skills and that compensation afforded them the opportunity to be generous. And they chose to be generous to him so that through his ministry, the lives of many might be changed. And this same dynamic was at play within the early church and it can be at play with us today. For many of us it is, that you have skills and experience and expertise that you have developed over years that you're compensated for and that compensation allows you the opportunity to be generous, which is just another way that your work opens the door for you to worship through your work, through the contributions it allows you to make and through generosity. The bottom line is, winning at work means seeing your work as worship. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for the time together this morning. Uh, We thank you that, um, that you demonstrate for us what it looks like to approach our work with faithfulness, even in the midst of the thorns and the thistles, and to approach it from a standpoint of knowing where our value is found, that our work is a gift to us, and it's a gift that we have the chance to offer to others. But I thank you that because of what you have done for us, it's not something that we need to look to to give us our value because our value and our worth is already grounded and secure in you. And for that, we thank you. And we praise you this morning in your name. Amen. Hey, would you please stand? Let's sing together. sing a thousand generations. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the 
song of ages to the Lamb. And all have gone before us. And all have gone before us. And all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. We sing your name. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name, it stands above them all. All thrones, all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Your name stands above them Don't forget we have worship night this Thursday, 7 p.m. at the South Jordan campus. We also have Connect Now happening right after this service over in the youth room. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.